Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. We're going to sing Everlasting God. rises we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord we will wait upon the Lord our God you reign forever our hope our strong Start us off with announcements and prayer time. Good morning, everyone. I won't bombard you with a lot of announcements this morning. Just want to let you know that uh, we are back on regular schedule now for youth group. So last week we took a, a break on Wednesday, but we are back on normal schedule um, for any uh, middle school and high school students. So if you've got some of those in your life or in your household, we'd love to hang out with them and walk through the Bible with them. So uh, feel free to ask me more questions another time about that. I think that's all the announcements I have this week. Isn't that a miracle? That's a small miracle in and of itself already this morning. Okay, well, let's just take some time and uh, we'll enjoy the background music, but more importantly, take some time to just um, seek the Lord, prepare our hearts, enter into this time of worship together. Maybe you have burdens that are on your shoulders that need to uh, be loosened and let go of. Um, or maybe this is a time of praise for you. Let's seek him and then we'll, we'll all come back together and worship in just a moment.
just want to thank you and praise you um, for your presence, for your goodness and grace to us. Lord, thank you that we can trust you in all things and that you are aware of the concerns and burdens of our heart. You have been with us as we've observed sin in the world this week, maybe even in our own households or our own lives. You experience the disappointments alongside of us. Lord, you have already been a a buffer, an encourager for us. And we, we continue to seek your wisdom, your grace. But Lord, we also desire discernment and power to not, to not be pulled down in the, um, the muck and mire of this world, but to, to have our countenance lifted above it by you that we might see from, from a bit of your vantage point that we might recognize your goodness and grace still in the world that your plan is marching forth uh, despite the opposition, despite the, uh, the seeming um, uh, grip that sin has on this world. Uh, your plan is not thwarted, that you are the victor, that you, um, that you will reign supreme Lord, I pray that we would be preparing our own hearts, that we would be mindful of our own um, obedience and our own uh, closeness with you. God, I pray that you would also fill us with a passion for those who do not yet believe, whether they be just like us and come from a similar background or whether they be totally different than anything we understand or have experienced. Um, God, I pray that we would not allow those things to be a barrier and a hindrance to us. Sometimes it's the hardest to be a witness close to home with people that we know who we feel will discount us or judge us. Lord, may you go before us that we might fulfill the role that you've given as your witnesses, as your evidence, your ambassadors of how good and how powerful you truly are. Lord, may we, um, may we embrace your forgiveness and cleansing from sin, that it would no longer be a shameful embarrassment to us, but it might be offered into your hand as an instrument of testimony um, and, and proof to the world that you can overcome sin. Thank you, Lord. We love you. I pray you would fill our praises and our, our meditations of our heart this morning. Um, truly, we want to worship you. You are worthy. In your name, amen. Let's worship together. Please stand. We're going to sing, Lord, reign in me.
light reflects the beauty of my Lord. To me, more to me than the earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Go reign in me. Reign in your power over all my dreams and my darkness.
start with uh, centering our hearts. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll look, look to where we're going in our text. Lord Jesus, thank you for um, the beauty of gathering together in your name and having some rest together and safety, and community, and the joy of lifting our praises and our meditations to you together as a family. Lord, now I pray that you would, that you would teach us, that you would aid us in understanding that you would convict our hearts where need be and illumine what needs to change, uh, what trust we need to have in you, that you would grow our faith and, and, um, and spur us forward as we, as we study your word 
as we seek to understand what it is that you have revealed to us and not understand it for some, I don't know, pop quiz or something, but understand it for the purpose of, of walking in the truth, of honoring you, of following you, that your full desire would, would, um, would blossom, would, would fulfill our lives, and that we would that we would take up our role as sons and daughters of you, as citizens of your kingdom, that we would be your church, your people, your family, and that you would be our God. Lord, may you, um, may you, even in this hour, bear radical witness to the world reveal yourself boldly to them through your word, but your word made manifest and evident through even our lives. Thank you, Lord. We, we press in toward you today. We lean on you today. In your name, amen. If you want to turn there, we are going to be in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. Make sure this is on here. We're going to be talking about the kingdom of heaven. God's kingdom, sometimes referred to as the kingdom of God in scripture. In most cases, those phrases are used interchangeably. Um... Our title that we have this morning is Disciples Live for the Kingdom. That's not meant to imply living for the kingdom somehow over and above God. Um, But live for the kingdom to be made manifest. We're going to take some excerpts here from Matthew 13. We're going to walk in in a systematic order. And in case you're wondering why, I, why I'm doing that, if you, I would encourage, if you like having follow-up, if you like exploring a little bit further, maybe with your Sunday afternoon to continue reflection, maybe on through the week, um, there are a few other parables, there are a few other stories here in Matthew 13 that I would encourage you to go back to, partly because... Um, the core principles in them are going to reinforce or be repeats of what we're looking at this morning, but also they're a little bit longer chunks, um, and some of them even have explanations provided in the text. So in a little bit when we're reading through, you'll notice that we we take a little bit of a jump uh, over a few verses in the text, and that's because for whatever reason, in the order in which this was written, there is an explanation to a previous parable given in the midst of what we're going to be reading. So um, you can go back and, and check those out and do some further study there in a little bit. Let me introduce here. So here's our big idea, and, and I want to hit on a couple of things in it. Jesus told parables. How many of you are familiar with that, that Jesus told parables? At least I can see in the room here. Okay. It's not a new uh, shock, particularly if you've you've gone the Sunday school route and grown up in the church or have some familiarity. Um, You have heard about parables. And parables are not unique only to Uh, biblical scripture. They're not unique only to Jesus, but rather it is a teaching instructional tool that Jesus chose to use. In fact, we're actually going to read at one point in here, it was foretold long before back in the Old Testament that when the Messiah came that he would teach in parables. And we'll see an overlap there. What is a parable? Simply understood, and and you could put this in your own words, but parables are illustrations of a moral or spiritual lesson. So they're usually in simple or condensed story form, and they invite us, the learner, 
in to ponder a bigger life lesson, a spiritual understanding, a moral point, using something more concrete, more identifiable within our lives, something simpler. It's especially the way that Jesus did it. It is intended to be food for thought. That doesn't mean that there's no imperative to it, that there isn't a command, an urgency behind it, but it's meant to be something that you wrestle with, that you think about, that you keep coming back to this simple story and going, okay, what does that mean? How does that fit here? How does it apply? How does it work? Okay, it's something to chew on. We're going to get several of those. Actually, we're going to walk through five of those today, but they're, they're short and they're in little couplets to, to teach some ideas. Jesus used these parables uh, to describe the nature of God's kingdom on earth. Simply put, there's no earthly kingdom that is like God's kingdom. It's a kingdom of exceeding value. We're going to see, among other things. Okay. Kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven, used here in our text, is to understand the process or the means that God is making manifest his rule through us, his followers, now in this world to continue on forever. You with me? That's a a lot of fancy words. So it's describing that God is up to something. He's doing something in our lives that begins now and is continuing on. And it is for it makes an impact. It changes the world. It makes a difference. Okay. So we're going to look at some of these illustrations of a bigger spiritual idea and uh, I'm sure that you can find more, but we're going to look at them under these three key umbrellas or key principles that are brought up. The first is we're going to take a look at the growth of the kingdom. Then we're going to see the value of the kingdom. And then finally, we're going to be challenged with the purity of God's kingdom. Are you ready? Here we go. We're going to take them um, section by section rather than reading all at a time today. And we're going to start in verse 31. So if you want to jump over there with me. The growth of the kingdom. Starting in verse 31. Yeah. Starting in verse 31, we get a couplet of two very short parables. It reads this way. He, being Jesus, presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is, the sm- is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and nest in its branches." He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. He goes on in verse 34. Uh, This actually isn't in our study notes, but I want to include it. Verse 34 says, All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable, Here's what I told you was coming. Verse 35. This was to fill what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundations of the world. I actually want to start with that part before I even get to our notes up here. We're told... Now, there's parables that were told before this. There are parables that are told after this. Here in Matthew, we have a coupling, and so you'll um, a, a consolidation of, a, of groups of parables, and it's put into some reasonable order for us. 
you'll see kind of loose connection um, wording between them. And that's probably because it's not asserting that Jesus sat down and shared these parables in this order. Boom, 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 boom. Or that these are the only parables that are ever told. Um, but rather that, this, that Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has taken some of the teachings of Jesus and collected them together. So what we're going to find here is a whole series of parables all on the theme of the kingdom of heaven. God's kingdom, how he wants to order things, what it is he is intending in his rule in our lives. It says that he does this, in, at least in part, if not completely, to fulfill what was prophesied, that he would teach in parables. This is not an accident. It's a fulfillment of the plan that God has had from the very beginning. So we'll take our first two parables that we're going to wrestle with today, often referred to as the, the um, parable of the mustard seed and the parable of leaven. Okay, Hopefully these, these may very well be familiar to this audience. Two simple stories. I'm not even going to go in a lot of detail about the stories themselves uh, but rather, what are they getting at? So the first story is one about a mustard seed, right? It is, it's pretty straightforward in it. You may know a lot about gardening and plants and stuff. I'm not going to go in tons of detail this morning. Many preachers have talked about all these things. Uh, but within the text itself, it gives you the necessary information. There's a farmer. He decides to plant a mustard seed plant, right? Right? And we're told that there's something kind of peculiar, kind of interesting as a matter of fact, which is that the seed used for this particular plant is a really small one compared to the other garden seeds. And yet, the irony or the juxtaposition here is this plant, when you plant it and let it do its full thing and it comes to full growth, is a great big plant. In fact, oftentimes it will be referred to as a tree. Now I have seen, I did do a little bit of research, there are smaller varieties that do exist that are used in gardens now. However, traditionally in the ancient world, the, the heirloom varieties, the beginning stuff was this way and still is in that area today. These great big bushy tree-like plants. So much so, he even describes it here as that the birds come and enjoy its, its size and, and regard it as a tree. Well, what's it getting at here? How, how do these stories uh, teach us of the kingdom of God? What point is he making? Well, here, I want to zero in on um, that the kingdom of God may have started with me, in meager ways but it grows exponentially. Now, what am I getting at there? There's a variety of ways in which we could look at this and see the smallness of how the kingdom of heaven begins. Okay? We might look historically and see how over and over again, God uses individuals or very small groups to be the remnant of the truth, the bearers of the good news of who he is. Um, we see him working with Adam and Eve and their responsibility to pass on the story. We see at the time of the flood that God uses Noah and a few family members to start all over again. We see God call Abram, out of all the other people, God calls Abram and makes a promise to work with him and his family and to use him. So in a sense, we see that over and over again, God delights in using smallness to get, a, get across a very big, important mission, a truth, a calling, the gospel. We see that he sends his one and only son, an individual, right? I'm going to dance around because I am getting blinded 
<laughs> here by the reflection of sunlight off of a vehicle. It's kind of fun. Um, it's like my own spotlight. So maybe you can see me better today. I don't know if that's a good thing for you or not. <laughs> we see them start with individuals, with small groups, even in the New Testament with the calling of his 12 disciples, then he begins to send them out. We could even talk about the nature of the disciples themselves, that they're not the elitist group, right? They're not the ones with the highest level of education and the degrees and all those kinds of things. Now, some of them are. When God uses Paul, Paul certainly was highly educated. So it isn't that God is stuck into a rut or a box, but we see over and over again, he starts with smallness. Now, beyond all those things, let's talk about the nature of the truth or the spread of the truth itself. At its heart, the kingdom of God God's people, God's church, while we get referred, we even use it in-house. I understand it. I'm not trying to fight against it. We are not primarily an organization. Despite the state's best effort, we don't fit the best as a business. That's how they treat us. They don't know what else to do with us. But we're not really a business. We're not... We should use good organization. We stumble there sometimes, but we're not really at its heart an organization. We're closer to a family, right? We are this living entity that God has done something with, has brought us into his family. And so... The spread of it, while there has been many times in history when the church has gotten tangled up, uh, maybe that shows a bias, I apologize for that, with the state, with government, and those kind of things. Let me back up and say, I think there is numerous very good ways in which Christians can be a part of, have an influence, participate in world governments. I don't have any problem with that at all. We can also see historically that it isn't always the healthiest choice for the church when it comes into partnership, one might say. We see that happen, but we're not primarily a government looking to take over countries or establish new geographic territory to claim with some flag. Uh, we're not primarily looking for some sort of earthly rule ourselves. The nature of the spread is not corporate takeover or some big, you know, ambitious master plan. How does it work? It works from, by the Holy Spirit leading the way in his mysterious behind the scenes work in individual lives. And then, <laughs> boy, I, I hope this isn't disrespectful, Lord. His crazy way of throwing each one of us, partly for our own good and development and stretching, into the mix to sometimes knowingly and sometimes unknowingly bear witness to the truth, kind of like water and fertilizer on seed, right? That it would, that the truth of who God is would be shared one to one soul at a time, would take root and would grow. Now, we're not even addressing that parable, if that sounds familiar to you today, but Jesus tells a whole parable about casting the seed of the gospel message and different soils, different readiness and preparedness of the heart that it may fall upon and what comes of that. 
it may start in meager ways, small, but it grows exponentially. What do we mean by that? One, it's not a guarantee or a promise. In this parable, this is a generally true statement, or we see it take place. There is power, which we're coming to, in the gospel message because of God, the truth and because of how God uses the truth. There is power to impact the individual's life and through the individual's life impact more individuals around them and it grows. It's the spread of word of mouth. In our era, right, we came up with a whole new means. We're like, okay, let's utilize electricity. And all of a sudden, we discover a phenomenon of we can do this really, really fast. We call it going viral, right? Information gets passed. People get excited about it and start recommending, suggesting, saying, hey, you got to check this out. And it grows, the same is true with the gospel. In my era, it was, it was going to school and finding out the latest recommendations on such and such TV program that the other kids were watching or the latest movie that had come out, right? And then everybody learned the catchphrases from it and such things. There is a viralness. There is an excitement. There is a word of mouth spread of the gospel that then is backed up by transformed lives. It grows. It comes into communities and changes communities. Uh, maybe this isn't your area that you've uh, gotten excited about in history. Um, I'm just kind of dabbling in it myself, but there have been great uh, what we call revivals around the world through history that, again, usually start very small, usually, and I'm, I'm not trying to teach this as a teaching point, just from what I understand so far, it is historically most often started in, with young people in prayer. And from that, the word of God becomes preached and shared and... <laughs> God does something amazing in a community. There are some stories. Uh, I have a great book in my office. I, I, I should read it again. It's been a long time. Uh, my dad gave it to me a long time ago because I did not like reading, and he thought maybe this would encourage me. It's a great book. It's one of my favorite books because there's a Colt 45 on the cover. And I like a Colt 45 old-fashioned wheel gun pistol. And the title of the book is Bi uh, Gun in Pocket, no, Bible in Pocket, Gun in Hand. And it's about some of the old circuit riding preachers and guys here in the United States. And some of these guys walking over to the tavern and, and pulling their gun out and setting it on the table and saying, okay, I expect everybody across the street for preaching. And hauling out people from the tavern and preaching. Okay, I'm not endorsing or not endorsing such things. There has been times in which God has done incredible work, shocking work, changed whole communities, families radically by the spread of the gospel and the change of hearts. That not because of laws or a bunch of pressure, but because of genuine transformation of the heart, vices were let go of. Um, people's lives were put back together. Families were healed. The work that God can do. Okay, I'm rambling at this point. Let's keep moving. You get the idea here. We, we get a picture through the mustard seed, that it may start small, it may seem insignificant, but it exponentially grows. And, um, and moving into the next point, it can 
outpower. It can be far more impactful than anyone might understand. So the, the second point with it is the kingdom of God may seem insignificant, but it has the power to transform the world. The leaven. Leaven is used oftentimes in Scripture. More often than not, leaven in Scripture is used as a negative. It's usually illustrating the spread of the sin condition within us. Uh, you might remember in the, in the great Passover, right, um, that, that the instruction from God was that they were to sweep out their houses, that they were to get rid of anything that had leaven and thoroughly clean the house, representing this idea of preparation. We're cleaning out our hearts. We're cleaning out our lives. We're getting ready to follow the way that God wants us to go, which means there can't be any room for sin. And and then they were to make unleavened loaves, right? Bread that did not rise was the idea. Here Jesus is coming back to this leaven idea, but he's doing so in a positive way. And he's saying the kingdom of God is like leaven also. It's like, it's like uh, the baker taking and mixing leaven into the dough. Uh, I understand that this three pecks of dough, this was a pretty good size, okay? Um, that even just putting a small amount in there and then working it through then has the effect on the whole. I'm not much of a baker. My wife makes yummy bread from time to time, which is fun. And it's awesome to see what it will do in a bowl. You mix in the leaven, you put the yeasty stuff, the good stuff in there, and you leave it in a bowl to kind of warm up. And the thing just grows and grows and grows. If you go crazy with it, I mean, there's great children's stories showing, you know, the bread dough just taking over everything, right? This idea that it spreads, that it saturates, that it begins small, but it, it, it fills. Okay, where am I going with this? It seems insignificant, but it has power to transform. It grows. Is true of the whole of the kingdom of God. It is also true on the microcosm of what's going on in my heart. See, as the seed is planted of faith, that I choose to believe who Jesus is, that he really is the incarnate Christ, God himself come. And what he has done, what he has promised is true. That seed is nurtured in witnessed to, Scripture tells us, by the Holy Spirit. And I come back to his word time and time again. And I chew on this piece for a while. And I chew on that piece for a while. And my faith grows and it begins, the point is, that the truth of who God is saturates my whole life. Everything becomes yielded to God's rule and his authority. So as I discover something new in my scripture reading and my meditation and reflection, I may not feel equipped and ready for it right away. I'm not trying to give you an excuse. I'm just being real. It may hit me as hard. It might make me angry. You ever come across those places in scripture? Where today it's like, ooh, I don't like what that's saying. I don't want to do that. That's too hard. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to. As that sits with me and I wrestle with this relationship with God, which is teaching me to have a yes first attitude with him. And I trust him that fight begins to fade away. And I begin embracing what he's telling me and putting it into practice and saying things differently with my kids 
and changing my schedule. Maybe I need to get up earlier in the morning. That's my least favorite. Um, there's things that begin to change. Okay, you, you get the point. Is this true on the big macro level that sometimes we see the power of God's kingdom move? Remember Jesus said that, um, oh, now, now I, it's off the top of my head and I'm going to quote it wrong because I'm notorious for that. He speaks of, as he's looking out at Caesarea Philippi, <laughs> and the horrible debauchery taking place in front of the false idols. And he's looking at a place known as the gates of to hell. He says, I tell you, if you have faith like a mustard seed, that the kingdom of, that the gates of hell will not stand against the kingdom of God. It's true on that big macro level, but it's true in my individual heart. The power is there. It's, satu- it's to saturate our lives. I better keep moving. Oh, yeah, I was going to warn you of this. Stumbling along today. We're going to do some interaction stuff today. It's not well planned. We don't have microphones. It's not going to be very watch friendly at home. I apologize for all of those things. Our point this morning is not to be super well polished. Our point is that we would actually grow with the Lord and that we would be challenged a little bit. So let me ask you a question. It's right up on the screen, it's not a trick question. Where have we seen the growth of the kingdom of God? Give, two of you shout out answers to me, and I'll try to repeat them. Where have we seen the growth of the kingdom of God? Okay, on Powell Boulevard, I'm told. So God might be doing something new there. How about historically or, or things that you've witnessed? You'll warm up for the next. Asbury Seminary and College has had a huge revival this year. Absolutely. Maybe you've seen that. Uh, Enough so that in a season that uh, I'll, I'll express my bias here. I'm not trying to lead you down any political path. In a season that has not seemed very evangelical Christian friendly, made mainstream media. That's weird, right? Um, that doesn't happen very often. Okay. How about if you, if you read up on these kinds of things, you'll see that the predominant growth and movement uh, of, the, of, of Christianity, biblical Christianity, is primarily in the southern hemisphere and eastern hemisphere, growing rapidly through Africa, South America, um, East Asia, um, and East and South Asia, predominantly, huge amounts of growth. Again, probably not the kind of thing that our our media here in the United States is going to cover widely in 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 broadcasts, um, but is in having incredible impacts. Okay, let's keep going to our next set of two. Uh, we're going to skip a few verses and pick back up in verse forty four. too far. Talking about the value of the kingdom of God. So the first part was talking about the nature of growth. Now we're going to talk about the value of the kingdom. These may be familiar to you. Starting in verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again and from joy over it goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls, and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Two simple stories, two simple pictures, right? There's something valuable, really, really valuable, Valuable enough that it grabs the attention. 
that it sparks excitement. How valuable is this found thing in both cases? They share the same similarity, right? They are both valuable enough that the finder willfully gives up everything, sells everything, trades everything. It's an all-in find. It's worth everything. Not in principle, not as a nice idea, in an actual response. I give up everything because this is what I've been looking for. This is worthwhile, right? Okay. The kingdom of heaven is worth the price of giving up everything else for it. Amen? <laughs> Careful now. Careful now. Now we've got to have a real discussion here as nice church people in pews. And I'm not knocking you. I'm right there with you. Hmm. <laughs> This is where Jesus does that Jesus thing, right? So we get two little tiny short stories. Simple little things. You can remember the general idea of these pretty easily. You don't have to memorize the exact wording. You can walk with these and chew on them, right? Now we've got to have a discussion. The difference between Doctrinal claims and real belief. That sounds fancy. We're not going to be fancy. There is a big difference between all of us here, and I mean this nicely, this is not negative toward you. If we raise our hands and say, yes, I believe that this morning. I'm going to take at face value that you really mean that with your whole heart. I hope you take that at face value with me. I don't have any problem with that. This is not the test. Our vote here means almost nothing. There's only one test for this, isn't there? Whether I actually live this out every single day, am I willing to give up stuff today to live in, to walk according to, to grow in, to thrive in the kingdom of heaven? Am I going to do things God's way today, now, with this choice, with this thing? That's the test. It's not, it's not relevant how nice it sounds to us, whether it strikes our ear the best way, whether the preacher is illustrating it or saying it or explaining it the best way. The only thing that matters is, have I really come to grips with that Jesus Christ and his kingdom is worth everything? That's why we get, <laughs> that's why we're intolerable as, as followers of Jesus to the rest of the world. Do you understand that? There's only really one issue that the world has with real Christianity, and it's this Jesus is the only answer. If we were to compromise or give up that point, the world would pretty much leave us alone and say, you do your thing, we'll do our thing, whatever. But to be all in on that point, that Jesus is it, that his kingdom is worth everything, that his way is the only way to eternal life, to correct relationship with God. It's the only answer. Um, that'll put you out on the stoop of society. There's a big difference between what I claim to believe that I say, oh yeah, that, that's definitely what Jesus is teaching there fits. 
There's a big difference between that and my actual belief, what I'm really willing to do. So here's another interaction point. Here you go. You ready for this one? How has following Christ brought you great joy? Do you see the great joy in both of these stories for both of these individuals? They found it and went, yes, this is worth it. This is what I've been looking for. This, this is wonderful. So is there two of you who would jump in with a testimony and say, this is how following Christ has brought me great joy? We're not used to this. Go for it, Bonnie. So Bonnie has experienced the claim of God that he would give peace that passes understanding and has made an impact in her family. Anybody else? Okay, so experiencing the support of God through the community of his people and they're, they're being willing to manifest God's love. I'm afraid that all too often, myself included, sometimes there are those opportunities and we miss them. Okay, ready to move forward? Here we go. This is my least favorite. I don't know if I'm allowed to, to tell you that, but I'm going to tell you that. This is my least favorite. The, th the theme, the lesson for us, revolves around the purity of the kingdom. I don't like this story. It's about fishing. I like fishing. I love fishing. It's f I, I know I'm one of those guys. I think it's fun. But read the story with me. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers. But the bad fish they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire, into that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasures things new and old. Let's talk about the parable of the dragnet for a moment. The kingdom of heaven will only have those who have put their faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. The picture here is familiar to those, <laughs> we have a resident expert with us, to those who understand large-scale fishing, commercial fishing, the way that you do it. For them, they use these drag nets. They either pulled it behind a boat or they cast it out from the shore or a combination of both and cast it out from a boat. It's a big net, weighted, weighted ring, weights around the edge of the net, and a rope on it, you throw it out, you hope that it goes over the top of schools of fish, a group of fish, or gets pulled along behind the boat past the fish, and you try to grab all of them that you can, and you figure it out later, right? The goal is, get the fish in the boat, we're hungry, we want to sell them, right? You've got a goal, a mission that you're trying to accomplish, get them in. Here the scripture says that the kingdom of heaven functions somewhat like that dragnet in that now 
in this time, as people hear the good news and truth, as people bump shoulders and hear testimony, like Bonnie and Juanita were just speaking to, as God does something in somebody's heart and they begin to manifest love towards others, demonstrate peace in their life, graciousness towards others, patience with others, right? It impacts the people around them. And they get curious. They want to see. They experience some of that love from that community. And people come in. Not, I'm not just talking about our church walls. It may include that. But they come in. They come near. They come see. There's a whole parable before this, by the way, at the beginning of chapter 13, called the parable of the tares in the wheat. Same sort of idea. In, in that story, it's that there's good plants growing up in the field, and there's not desired plants, right? Weeds, right along with it. And you either can't tell the difference, or what do you do about it? If you start pulling out the weeds, you end up pulling out the good stuff as well. Here the idea is we've gathered all the fish, and now we've got to make the choice what comes with and what gets discarded. What is what we want and what isn't. This sounds negative about God, right? God's being choosy. He's being judgmental. He's deciding the worth of people is what it looks like. Now, what do we have here? We see that in the end, that there is a time of judgment. That may not be what the passage uses as a word, but that's, that's what's happening, right? That there is someone in charge of making the decision. God makes the decision. In this case, he sends forth his servants, the angels, to come and to, to separate. This is not the only place in Scripture that it talks about this, and I know this group here today to know you're not going to fight with me. You understand this from Scripture, that there is this dividing, there is this separating. Why is judgment a necessary part of God's final work? Ever sat down and just chewed on that for a while? Those of us who are Bible readers, we know it's in Scripture. The world knows and makes a big deal that we have it in Scripture and thinks it's the only thing we ever talk about and think about is how good or bad people are and, and, and sit around trying to be the judges or something. Why is this important for God's final work? Well, I don't know that this is a complete answer, but let me offer two particular areas. One is this idea of purifying. God by nature is pure and holy. And he is inviting people to come out of corruption that they have experienced through the through the through the corruption, through the infusion of sin, right? And to be made pure and holy like him again. I don't mean equal to God and having exactly the same nature, right? But a cleansing of our spirit. There's a purifying. That's true of his work in us who believe that he, he's doing this purifying work. The big fancy word, if you want it, is sanctification, right? That he is sanctifying us. He's setting us apart. He's cleansing us. He's making us holy again. But it's true of his whole kingdom. Other places in scripture talk about the church being this pure, spotless bride dressed in all white, right? With no blemish, no wrinkle, no, no problem. Like, like a, a bride on her wedding day, 
dressed in the finest, purest white, right? And he's saying that's what my church is to be. It's to be clean. It's to be pure. It's to cast off even every hint of sin and impropriety. Can I, that's big standards. Can I do that myself? No, of course not. The only way that this makes any sense, the only way that this is achievable is not through my achievement. It is only by total surrender, by giving up to God in his rule, in his way. That's, that's it. That's why this thing is called a kingdom, because he is to be totally in charge, sovereign, right? If there is... I don't even know what I'm talking about here. If there are holdouts in a kingdom, if there are rebels, if there are those who are, uh, you know, have their side conspiracy working going on, what's to be done? Is that just to be tolerated and ignored? Is Is that the good thing? Is that a good king? No, what's to be done is for that to be found and taken care of in one way or another, depending on the hardness of the individuals, right? It's got to be uprooted. It's got to be removed. The the body, the whole, needs to be made pure. So part of what God's doing is a purifying work within the kingdom. This is a weird way to say it. I had to wrestle with this. I I really appreciate it, though. I hope I can relay it well. This is also an encouragement to the believers. Wait a second, preacher. (laughs) What are you saying? I'm supposed to be happy about people entering into judgment, being separated out? No, that's not what I'm saying, okay? Okay? We're saying here is that God is just. And so as the truth is spread wide and free, God demonstrates his open arms of love and compassion. We see that beautifully on the cross with Jesus. Forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. Right? Come one, come all, receive, come near. But at some point, there has to be the final decision. And it is just, it is right for God to say, to say, to take action on These chose not to be a part, not to participate, not to receive the truth. They warred against, they turned away, they they made life miserable for my children. They attacked, they hurt, they whatever. There is an encouragement to those who believe that justice will prevail, that God will purify, and the time of his full rule will come, not just in my heart, but now in the community as a whole, that his kingdom will prevail and will be, just as he has told us, it will be an eternal, everlasting kingdom that begins now. What should be our response to the warning of God's judgment? Well, it shouldn't be, forget you guys, right? As sensitive as our prior discussion is in our current world, it it didn't used to be, but it is now. 
The answer is not, ha ha, God's on my side and I get my justice in the end. So let's all just hide away from the rest of the world. Let's just point fingers at, let's make fun of, let's, let's mock, let's just express how angry we are at other people and what they're doing and those kinds of things. Y'all ever felt angry about some of the stuff that you observe in the world? Me too. Okay? I get it. That, that's I'm not saying we're not going to have those emotions. But that's not the answer to just be like, aha, see, we get justice in the end. No, this warning is not just given to you and me. The warning is not only given to the believers. The warning is given to everyone. How does the kingdom grow? It grows through the testimony. It goes through the evidence. It goes, grows through the boldness of what God is doing in your life, made manifest and shared with the rest of the world. Right? They hear it from us. They see it in us. The Holy Spirit paves the way or, or cultivates the way and, and we, um, we sow the seed and God brings something about from it. What should be our response? Well, we should join in the warning. We become the warners. Um, I don't know if that looks like you know, the, 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 the age-old you know, guy with the sign in the park of, you know, hell is coming or those kinds of things. Um, I'm not sure if that's always the most effective means in the world. But it certainly is not the opposite extreme of, I guess there's nothing I can do about it. Doesn't really matter. The world keeps turning. No, there, there should be an, an urgency that falls on our hearts and lives that there is warning that needs to take place. place. And what does that result in? You're... you're not going to like me. That results in me being passionate, right? There's a reason. There's a danger. There's something to get excited about. So I become passionate for others, for their safety and warning, and I express that through sharing what I believe, what I understand to be the truth. I become a passionate testifier to the truth. Please, God loves you. He wants better for your life. He can clean you. He can teach you in the way to go. There is danger coming. Are you with me? Do you know what I just defined? Passionate proclamation or testimony of the truth. By definition, we have a word for that. It's the word preach. By definition, that's what preaching is. Does that mean that you all need to be in pulpits like you have decided to put me in today? No. No. This doesn't define preaching. What we just read about defines preaching. You're to be preachers. I'm to be a preacher, not just in this pulpit every once in a while, in our lives. And the definition of preaching is not boring, theological, droning on of big, fancy words like some of us get stuck into from time to time. It's being so convinced of the power and growing nature of God's kingdom, of its surpassing value, that it's worth everything. And as I'm testing that, I'm experiencing the, the payoff, the evidence of it more and more in my own life. I'm becoming more convinced it's worth everything and becoming passionate about sharing that experience 
experience that truth, that warning with those that are in my life, that I come in connection with. It means, boy, I'm going to meddle here. Listen to the Spirit, not just my words. It means that I choose to believe when God teaches me that stuff doesn't belong to me. It is entrusted to me. That enables me to get behind and be passionate about how I financially support those who are taking the message places. It allows me to be in my social fear of what others might think of me and discomfort in talking, it allows me to take steps anyways and get to know people over the back fence or down the street or at the coffee shop or whatever it may be. The more convinced I am in the value of the kingdom, the necessity of the kingdom, the more I become a passionate proclaimer of the truth. Okay. Now let me not be mean to you. Let me aim at myself. If I reverse engineer, if I look at how I've been defining things, the other direction. Then I can go, am I passionately proclaiming the truth in the spheres that God has entrusted to me? If my answer is yes, how, do I, how can I celebrate that? How can I look at what God has done in my life and take joy in that and give him praise? If my answer is no, then I go back to what am I really believing? Am I believing the value of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that that is the only way? Do I believe that? Do I believe that God has a mission, that he wants to take this truth and spread it and impact others? If it's not coming out of me, there's a breakdown in the belief system somewhere that I need to go back to. Okay, I better wrap up. Because we've come to know the unmatched value of God's kingdom, we live willing to sacrifice everything so that others may be part of the kingdom through faith in Jesus. Am I willing to give up everything? I have no idea what Jesus will ask you to give up in your life. I know that it starts here with the willingness to give up everything. Um, I know in my own life, and I, I don't have time left to tell stories, but I know in my own life, the willingness came first. Then there have been many things that God has given back or entrusted to me for a time. Uh, but as soon as I start grabbing onto and saying, oh, well, I'm going to be in charge of this, or I can move ahead in this area, or, you know, uh, I, can, I can be a little more laxed. I don't, I don't need to be as fervent in this area. Um, I notice it in God's favor. I notice it in how life works. I notice it in my attitude. I notice it in even how I feel um, it has an impact. Would you pray with me? Uh, Lord, these 
may be familiar parables to us. I'll just be honest. They're familiar to me. And, uh, and they're easily set aside as, oh, just nice things to think about from time to time or that f- familiar thing that comes up in a class or a sermon, whatever it might be. God, help us not to do that today. No. Not based on my preaching ability, but Lord, may we, may we really listen to your spirit and give you full access to our hearts and lives and not just imagine what life might be like if we gave you full control or gave up everything. But God, I, I pray that we would urgently seek you, that you would have full control and that you would convict us of any area that we're holding on to, that there would be that there would be affirmation, that there would be a peace, that there would be freedom in in totally giving you control and that we would see fruit being born in our lives. Uh, Fruit of our own character changing, fruit within our family dynamic and the joy and the peace and the healthiness there fruit in um, in lives being saved through through testimony being able to be a part of that in other people's lives God may you may you be glorified in your name amen go with the parables of God on your heart and mind living as his witnesses to your community. You're dismissed.